Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first, I would like to say thanks for having me here this morning, allowing me to um, preach this morning, and thanks for supporting me. Yes, I have gotten to know some of your members. I hung out with several of the elders already, and this group over here. <laughs> yeah. Where is Glenn? Oh, this is for him. He, he encouraged me to use the stage, so he's not here for me to use the stage. <laughs> so um, I would not keep you long. Um, we would be coming from Mark chapter 6, verse 45 through 51. Verses 45 through 51. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat. And go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. I would like to talk about this morning, don't be afraid of the storms. Don't be afraid of the storms. When I looked at the word storm, that it has many def- definitions. The one that stood out to me the most was a violent disturbance of the atmosphere with strong winds and usually rain, thunder, lightning, or snow. Strong winds, rain, thunder, lightning, or snow. When I processed this, I thought about Hurricane Katrina. And when I read some of the stories from Hurricane Katrina, they all had one thing in common, and it was, it was the typical hurricane season. So it was the norm for some to board up their houses and leave. It was a norm for some to hunker down and weather the storm out. But nevertheless, it was typical hurricane season. But little did they know that Hurricane Katrina would cause so much damage and many lives would be taken by this storm. And just like nature, it brings about hurricane season. I am sure we all can agree in the room this morning that we have faced seasons in our lives that we have that brought about storms. Now, those storms, they could present themselves as marriage issues, financial issues, issue on the job, issue with drugs, or just the typical struggling with sin. And when we are faced with those issues, we refer to them as the storms of life. Now, if we're not careful, if we don't handle those storms well, what would happen? The same thing that happened with, in, with Katrina in, in Louisiana, the same thing would happen to us. We will, it will cause a lot of damage in our lives. So just like nature, it brings about season that we cannot avoid what each season brings. It is the same when it comes to the storms of life. No matter how hard we try, we cannot avoid them. So I heard it this way. I'm from Mississippi, so there's a lot of old sayings that we say growing up in the South. So I heard it this way growing up. You may have heard it too. You could be in a storm right now. You could be on your way out of a storm. You could be on your way into a storm. If you're not in a storm, give it some time because one is on the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I stop to encourage you this morning and say, don't be afraid of the storms. So when we look at verse 45 through 48, it says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. The first thing I would like to look at or encourage you in that is don't be afraid of the storm because God knows and he sees. Because God knows and he sees. When we look at verse 45, we see Jesus made his disciples get back in their boat and head across the sea. The NLT tells us that he immediately insisted. So this tells us that Jesus made his disciples, commanded his disciples to get back in the boat and head towards the storm. Jesus knew it would be a storm, and Jesus allowed a storm to happen. And in obedience, the disciples got back in their boat and headed towards the storm. Now, I would like to stop for a second and say, just because we are obedient to God doesn't mean we will not have storms in our lives. John tells us this morning in John 16 and 33, 
I have, these, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, church, this is not a prosperity gospel. This is not a feel-good gospel. John tells us that we will face tribulation, or in our context this morning, we will face storms in our lives. But because we have Jesus, we can overcome the storm. Now, I think we all have been there. We all can witness and say that um, sometimes we all get so focused on the storm, we allow it to dictate to us how we should feel at the moment. And if we're not careful, we allow that storm to cause us to ask the question, does God know and does he see me in the middle of the storm? Well, verse 47 tells us, Mark tells us in verse 47 that it was only one person alone, and that was Jesus. He said the disciples were out on the boat on the sea, and Jesus was alone on land. Now, I love this verse because the waves, the winds, the water, the land presented Jesus to be far away from the disciples. But Jesus knew exactly where, what they was going through, and he saw exactly where they were. And, and most importantly, he knew and saw that they needed him. So have we been there? Have the chaos of our storm caused us to feel far away from God or caused us to ask the same question, does God know and does he see? Well, Mark is encouraging you. I am encouraging you this morning. Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. He sees exactly where you are, and he knows exactly what you need. And what we'll read later is, no matter how far we feel away from God, we are never too far that he cannot reach us because we see Jesus walking on the water. So I'd like to stop and ask a question this morning. What are you going through this morning? What storm are you facing this morning? What about that sin you are struggling with? It just seems like you just keep pleading to God. You are asking him to remove this sin, remove this, remove this. And the more and more you struggle with it, the, more, the harder it seems to overcome it. What about that marriage? You and your spouse are at odds with each other, and you find it hard to live out Ephesians 5. Wives, submit to your husband. Husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. What about singleness? Now, I think I can, this is my door right here. <laughs> this is my door. <laughs> uh, we, we plead with God to, we pray, asking him to send us a mate. And it just seems like the more and more we go on dates, he's not sending, and we're about to give, give up hope. And I remember... Um, I, this guy right here, one of my friends, he knows. Um, two years ago, starting about two years ago, God softened my heart for marriage. Like I, in my early 20s, I'll be 35 this year, and I had no desire to be married at all. But now I'm like experiencing this moment of going on dates. I get excited about when I meet somebody, and, and then I had to come back with the disappointment. It didn't work out. So now I'm like, oh, God, are you going to send me someone? Or are you going to send someone? And I'm about to give up hope. So I asked again this morning, what storm are you facing? Where do you need to know that God knows and he sees you? Well, wherever it is, whatever it is, know that he knows, he sees. And just like the children of Israel, he is trying to reveal his power in your life, in the middle of your storm. But let me backtrack real quick. I just brought up the story of children of Israel. Well, one story I missed in this, I jumped a little ahead of myself. In Exodus chapter 14, we saw and we read, we read in Exodus chapter 14 that, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. In verse 31, Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against them, and the Egyptians saw, and the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So this was the illustration I looked over, and I was supposed to talk about in the beginning, that this is how we know that God knows and he sees. So in this story, God told Moses to have the people encamp by the sea because he wanted to reveal his power and his glory to the children of Israel and to the Egyptians. So here we can take from this story that God knows and he, God knew exactly what was about to happen and God saw them by the sea. So whatever you are facing this morning, just know that whatever it is, God is just trying to reveal his power in your life, reveal his power in the middle of your storm. So let's look at verse 48. 
It says, about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost. I found this verse to be very funny. <laughs> you have the disciples out here battling a storm, and here comes Jesus just walking through like it's not a storm. You know, the commentary tells us that this is supposed to took an hour, but it took hours. Now, how would you feel? Now, we all know that the disciples and Jesus were friends. So how would you feel if your friend just came through after you just battling a storm and they're just going to walk by you and just annoy you? I mean, that is crazy. Like, Jesus, what are you doing? You got all power. What are you doing? You going to walk by me? What are you doing? But the text did say they thought he was a ghost. But, um, but what we can take from this is Jesus walked through the storm because he had complete control over it. So when we are facing with storms in our life, we can endure, we can walk through it with peace because Jesus has complete control over it. So have we been there? Have we been just like the disciples where we we're just battling our storms and, we just not, and we're not calling on Jesus? I would like to recall the story. Let's just recall a little bit what the disciples went through when they, when they walked with Jesus, some of their experiences. When we go back to chapter 4, you have them in another storm, and Jesus in the bottom of the boat, sleep. Jesus got up. He spoke to the sea. He said, peace be still. But in verse, verse 41, he said, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? We also see in verse 12 of chapter 6, Jesus sent them out. And the wind, and the wind sorry about that, Jesus sent them out. And they cast out many demons and anointed with all many who were sick and healed them. Also, we see in chapter 6, they witnessed him feeding, witnessed him feeding the 5,000. So now I find it hard to believe that out of the 12 of them, no one thought to call on Jesus. Out of the 12 of them, no one thought to speak to the sea. They saw him do it in chapter 4. They saw him feed the 5,000 in chapter 6. They came back reporting all the things they have done in his name, and no one thought to put their action in faith, put their faith in action. So now I believe this, that if they had called on Jesus, I believe Jesus would appear to them in the boat, or Jesus would have ran across the sea to save them. So I ask again this morning, how often do we find ourselves just like the disciples? We read scripture after scripture that tell us about the promises of God. We read scriptures that tell us that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We have witnessed the power of God in our lives, and we have witnessed the power of God in the lives of those around us. But when we are faced with, with a storm, we forget what he has done, and we forget to cry out to him. So I ask this morning, why is it hard for us to go to Jesus when we are in a storm? Why is it hard for us to go to Jesus when we are in a storm? I have four things here. The first thing, we want to be self-reliant. Just like the disciples out on the boat battling the storm, didn't call on Jesus, we do the same thing when we are faced with a storm. I know at an early age, my mom taught me independence. I started working at 16. But now, it's a good thing to be independent, but it's a bad thing when we allow it to think that we are more powerful, powerful than God. Because I have the issue sometimes on the spiritual side that instead of when a storm, when I am faced with a storm, I start relying on myself. I start trying to work it out on my own instead of going to Jesus. But what we are saying when we are doing that is, God, I do not trust you to handle this storm. The second thing is pride. We have no desire to admit that we are weaker than the all-powerful God. We have no desire to admit that we are weaker than the all-powerful God. The third thing, we find comfort in the things in other things instead of Christ. We find comfort in other things instead of Christ. When we are faced with a storm, we don't run to God and allow him to satisfy our every need. We start running to our comfort and start making idols out of those comforts. What is your comfort this morning? I know I like to watch TV. I like, like to watch TV and forget about what's going on in my life because it's like, I just want to escape it right now. What about food? What about video games? Whatever it is, what are you finding comfort in and making idols out of instead of allowing God to satisfy you in the middle of your storm? The last thing I have this morning is we're, we're not patient. God is not responding in our timing. 
We're going, making headway painfully and doing our own thing. We think God is a microwave. We pray one time. It's supposed to just disappear. I mean, that's what I do with the microwave. Hurry up and heat up, you know. Hurry up. So we, we expect the same thing with God. So let's back up to verse 48. It says, he meant to pass by, by them. Some scholars suggest that he meant to pass by them was to see if they would invite him into the boat. How many times have we overlooked God in the middle of our storm? God is right there. We are, we are trying to figure it all out, and God is right there waiting for us to invite him in. There's another old saying that I heard growing up. This is a good one. I love it. <laughs> While you're trying to figure it out, God has already worked it out. That's an old one. You know, a lot of times me and my sister, we would say this um, when you're younger, some of the stuff that was said or the songs that were sung, you didn't know what it meant at the time. But now that we're older, we wish we can go back to, like, I wish I understood then. And that was just one of those phrases growing up where I was like, why are you trying to figure it out? So now I'm taking hold of that now, like, okay, Demontre, why are you trying to figure this out? Why you just won't go to Christ? So, again, I would like to encourage you to say that you don't have to be afraid of the storm because he knows and he sees. Let's look at verse 50 and 51. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. The second thing I would like to look at is, don't be afraid of the storm because God will rescue you. God will rescue you. Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart. What does it mean to take heart? Take heart means to gain courage or confidence, to begin, to begin to feel better and more hopeful. Isn't it encouraged to know that when we invite Jesus into our storm, we can gain courage, we can feel better, and we can have hope? We can take courage because the God we serve is more powerful than our storm. We can take hope because the God we serve is more powerful than our addiction. We can take hope because... Take heart. I've been saying hope, but we can take heart because God is, because the God we serve is a provider. He is a protector. He is a healer, and he is shelter. Let's look at Joshua 1.9. Joshua 1.9 says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Yes, in your storm, you could feel lonely. Yes, it could be stressful. Yes, you may experience some hurt. And yes, you may experience some loss. But you can be, but be strong and courageous because God is with you wherever you go. We see here that when Jesus entered the boat, the wind ceased and the disciples were rescued from the storm. In John account, in John 6, 21, it says, Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. This informs us that once Jesus rescued them, they arrived to their destination safely. So that's encouraging. That is hope for us, church, that when we invite Jesus to our storm, we can arrive to the other side unharmed. So I have a lot of questions this morning. What would it look like when we trust Jesus in our storms and what will happen? What would it look like when we trust Jesus in our storm and what will happen? When we trust Jesus in our storm, one, the first thing is we will remain in constant prayer. We will remain in constant prayer. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 9. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 9. Here we have the story of Paul pleading with God about the thorn in his flesh. He said, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that, I should, that it should lead me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect. In weakness, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so the power of Christ may rest upon me. When we trust Jesus in our storm, we remain in constant prayer. And what will happen? God will give us grace to endure the storm. And God will give us power and strength in the middle of our storm. The second thing when we trust Jesus in the middle of our storm, we will rejoice in our storm. We will rejoice in suffering. Romans 5, 3 through 5. It says, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that the suffering produces endurance, 
Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not, does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured, poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So we can rejoice. We can have hope in our storm. And due to that, when we trust Jesus and have hope, what it produces? Our storm produces endurance, it produces character, and it produces hope. The last thing I have here, when we trust Jesus in our storm, we will wait on the Lord. We will wait on the Lord. Isaiah 40 and 31. Isaiah 40 and 31. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So when we are trusting Jesus in our storm, we will wait on him. And what he says is what will happen is when we wait on him, he will renew our strength. And when we're in our storm, we will not grow weary. So in this first part, I talked about rescue and the aspect of God removing the storm immediately. Like we saw him remove the uh, calm the sea with the disciples. Well, I like to come from this from a different angle, from a different perspective. Sometimes God will give us exactly what we need to endure the storm. And what do I mean by this? Some people are losing their mind in that storm, but God kept you in your right mind. Some people are panicking in their storm, but God gave you peace. Some people are unhappy and he gave you joy. Some are, running, some are finding comfort in alcohol and drugs, but he allowing you to find comfort in him. I love, I love the story of Peter in Acts chapter 12. Peter was chained to the guard. And Herod just killed James, and Peter was up next to be killed. But what I believe, what I believe about the story is Peter knew that God could rescue him or had faith that God would rescue him. Or Peter knew that God would rescue him and he would see him face to face. So what I'm saying this morning, church, is rescue may not look the way we want it to look or the situation being removed right away like the disciple, but God will rescue you. I'm experiencing this right now. So as Brian said earlier, I'm in a pastoral residency. I'm um, honestly, I'm in a transition right now. This, this was my last week at Matthias, and I'm headed to Ellsbury. But in 2020, me and my mentor, we were um, praying through whether or not to be a missionary full-time, because I had a heart to be a missionary, or a ministry here in the States full-time. And in September of 2020, we sensed that God was leading me to do ministry here in the state full-time. So I was introduced to Jason Zelmer, and then you all know the, the one and only John Ryan, I was introduced to him. And um, so we was praying, and the decision came for me to leave my home church, the church I belonged to, uh, four years, Waypoint. And that was a hard decision to do. It was hard leaving Waypoint. But I knew when I took this faith journey, I knew there was a chance I had to leave the church that I loved so dearly for uh, four years. I would have to leave my job for seven years, and I would have to leave where I've been staying for seven years. Now, the change alone was a storm for me because I don't adjust well to storms. <laughs> I mean, they was happening back to back if you just knew. Like, there was some moments where I was in the office with John just crying like, I can't take this. <laughs> um, but just like the disciples battling the winds and the waves, I felt like the wind started blowing harder in my storm as the days approach of me leaving my job at General Motors. And when I left my job, it, it was hard. I didn't think it would be hard, but it was a challenging thing. And then the other thing to add on to that, as I was taking this faith journey, at the time I hadn't raised all the support I need to do the residency full time. I would not lie to you that I had many moments that I laid in my bed before I went to sleep or before I got up in fear. The unknown was causing me fear. And then when the decision came for me to move to Ellsbury, more fear came in where I was like, God, would I find a reasonable place to live before my lease is up? And then I was questioning and asking the question, how would rural Missouri look like? <laughs> what would it look like for being rural Missouri? I mean, it was challenging to think about that. But I met Sam. He's, he's a great guy. Um, but I also remember this. 
I remember being home last year in Mississippi for Christmas, and I had a conversation with my sister. And they tying in together what I'm facing in the storm because it's, it's overlapping. But we was having a conversation, and a lot of times when I go home, I'm comparing myself to my family at home. And I made the statement by saying, I am broke. And my sister immediately told me, and she responded and said, you're not broke. From a worldly standpoint, you may look that way, but from a spiritual standpoint, you are not. So she started asking me questions. She asked, are your bills paid? Are you losing sleep at night? Are you wanting for anything? And of course I answered no. And she was like, well, you're not broke. <laughs> well, my point in saying this, God knows what I'm going through. He sees me and he has rescued and he is rescuing me. It may not be in the way I want it, but he is rescuing me. So I want to leave you with this final encouragement. Let's look to Jesus as our greatest example. Jesus was faced with a storm, and it was the cross. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed three times for God to remove the cup, and God didn't. Now, I'm sure that Jesus felt as if God did not see him in the middle of this storm, in the middle of this prayer. But what did Jesus say at the moment? Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. How many, of, how many of us can say that we have said that in our storm, that God is not what I want, but it's what you want? Let's look at Luke 22 and 43. It says, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. God gave Jesus exactly what he needed to endure the storm of the cross. Jesus went to the cross with joy. Hebrews 12 and 2. Look into Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus bore our sins. He took our punishment. He took our guilt and our shame. And what we can take from this is sometimes our storms are not about us. Jesus went to the cross for us to make salvation available to us. Jesus went to conquer Satan, sin, and death. And so with that, oh, most importantly, he went so we can be reconciled to God. So sometimes our storms are not about us. Sometimes people need to see. We are the only Bible that some people see. People need to see Christ in the middle of the storm. People need to know that they can experience peace, joy, endurance in the middle of the storm. So the only way they can experience that is through Jesus. The only way we can go through our storms, the only way we can experience a storm and not have any, any fear is through Jesus. So I leave you this morning by saying, do not be afraid of the storm because he knows, he sees, and he will rescue you. Let us pray. God, I just thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. I thank you for being a way maker. God, I just pray right now that if anyone going through anything, God, I just pray that you just reveal to them who you are. God, I pray that they just turn to you and run to you in the middle of a storm. God, I just pray that they rely on you in the middle of a storm. But God, give them hope. Give them endurance, God. Give them courage, God. Allow them to take heart, God. And God, I just pray now that you just surround them around people, God, that will point them to you. So God, let them find their hope in you. Let them find their peace in you, God. God, I just pray for this morning that you'll shine through us. And God, if we're in the middle of a storm, God, let us take courage. Let us take heart, God, in the middle of the storm that people around us may see you, God. As the storm continue to blow and press in, God, that you will just come out of us even more. That you will be shined. That you will be glorified, God. And that you get the glory. And I ask all this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.